Hello everybody and welcome to tier 3 part 1 of the film fan theories iceberg explained. Now we're starting to get into the deeper sort of layers of the iceberg here. The actual iceberg doesn't have names for each layer but um, these, these are really interesting and um, it's starting to get a lot more obscure here. So yeah, uh, thank you again for all the support and we're just going to get right into it. Dorothy is the Wicked Witch of the East. We've obviously already gotten into some Wizard of Oz stuff with the Hanging Munchkin theory, but this one is more plot related. Because Glinda the Good Witch of the North doesn't actually identify the witch that was crushed, it posits that maybe Dorothy is the Wicked Witch of the East. And it really, this one really makes you think about, it's a lot like the Wally is evil um, theory where it makes you think about a t completely twist 180s every motive that uh, Dorothy has of why she's doing what she's doing. Perhaps she is a witch and that she doesn't know it. Perhaps she does know she's a witch. You know, there are lots of things there that make you think, well, you know, why is she doing what she's doing and the intentions behind her actions? It would make sense perhaps why she wants to go to see Oz himself. Perhaps she wants to kill him. Perhaps, you know, there are many, many reasons why she could be doing what she's doing. Maybe she wants to round all these good people up to turn them into soldiers for the little monkey army. You know, those flying monkey fucking things. Those things are fucking crazy, man. They're creepy. They're creepy. Like, imagine... That's mental. Um, but yeah, it's a really good one. Again, like the Wally is evil theory. And, you know, maybe... We've, it's actually come to think of there are lots of different things to do with the Wizard of Oz. Maybe they're all connected. For example, the Hanging Munchkin uh, one. Maybe she, Dorothy hung one of the Munchkins, not in real life, obviously, but in the film. And the Dark Side of the Moon sinking is actually hints to the the eeriness i mean because it is very eerie in the production of the wizard of oz if you watch uh videos on that i'm gonna watch a video again about it the, you know they had asbestos was the snow you know people were very mistreated uh the girl who plays dorothy she was exploited a lot and there's just a lot going on there and it's just a very eerie uncanny and i think very liminal you know i think lots of people point to that being the first liminal film you know liminal space backrooms sort of experience film piece of media i suppose where it's it's supposed to be all this this oh everything's great but there's just something that's very very strange about it and it just puts you off and i think that's down to a lot a lot down to a big part of that is down to the production and what happened behind the scenes. But you could definitely put all those together. And, um, you know, obviously you don't, you, it's, you don't want to be insensitive about the hanging munchkin because that was a theory about a real uh, person and I hope no one was hurt. But uh, if you put them all together in the plot of the film, it, you, you could put something together there and it could be really interesting, like I said. Um, but yeah, it could all be really about this eerie the the blurred line between good and evil and that's what uh chat gpt actually prompted me to to think about with uh, what it what it wrote there you know the the real motives there and the real side of good and evil in the films or in that film particularly obviously they made a prequel but yeah john mason is an older james bond so in this film called the rock which sean connery is in he has a lot of really efficient combat skills and he's very similar to James Bond with his skill set. Therefore, people think that it is actually in the same world as James, the James Bond films, 007 films, and that he's actually, his character in that film is actually an older James Bond because obviously, you know, the, the coincidences are, are crazy there. I always love continuations like this, like uh, the Malcolm in the Middle theory that you know, Malcolm in the Middle, which I hope we were able to do some TV show fan the theory iceberg explained uh, videos and a series. And I'm able to find a good iceberg to do it on or perhaps create my own, we'll see. Um, that theory that basically Malcolm in the Middle takes place after Breaking Bad. The theory is that it's after, and there's even a skit about it, which is really funny. I really love things like that, you know, that an entirely different character could be, actually be branched off from another. Um, 
it's it's fascinating to think about and it's really interesting to think about the coincidences there and also you know if the filmmakers had that in mind um, which i'm sure most of the time 99 percent of the time they didn't but yeah this one definitely is good for all those all the peeps that love james bond finding nemo is about the five stages of grief Obviously, Marlon goes through a lot in this film, and it's hard to believe because of the loss uh, of Nemo that perhaps, you know, a lot of these things aren't real. Grief uh, is a horrible thing um, that eats you up inside and creates these almost delusions or even, you know, false holds on reality that you think, you know, the person's still alive and I, you know, I'm going to start to tear up. But it's just... A, awful the the feelings that it can induce and the fake realities that it could put you through the hallucinatory realities and it makes you really after having that perspective or knowledge or education about grief think that this film is only about that but actually you know perhaps when all of his family members are killed nemo actually died as well and that nemo actually was never there throughout the entire film and he's imagining him and his journey to return nemo is you know hallucinatory denial anger bargaining depression and acceptance draw parallels within this film to the characters that they go by and the the things that they face the obstacles that they face it obviously gives you a completely crazy perspective when you think of it that way it makes you think of it as a new layered piece and that's really good it's never bad it's never a bad thing because i personally don't really like finding nemo i remember i watched it i think i watched it in class uh, a while back and it just felt very repetitive repetitive and that could change that and it could change the narrative into something completely different in a good way so i think i really do think it's a it's about that and i think what they mean is only about that right the the reality isn't real what we're seeing isn't real and it's an untrustworthy narrator i can't think of the the phrase now um specific phrase of that but yeah i think it's definitely already about grief but i think in terms of the reality we're in i don't think it's real and i think uh, Marlon is going through something that perhaps is hallucinatory and is fake uh, and this is quite similar to the Matrix theory we covered in, uh, I think, Tier 2, Part 1. Cobb's wedding ring is his totem. So we all know that the totem is very important in the world of Inception. Every character needs it to know if what they're living through is real. It's their tether to reality. It's their tether to anything that they could ever perceive is real. Uh, obviously, we get the implication that uh the cobb's totem is the spinning top and i don't even think that his totem being the spinning top is ever actually completely verified or said in the film i might be wrong uh but i have seen inception a lot of times uh many times um and it would actually be such a nolan thing to do especially given the fact that he kind of loves to set things up but also not completely uh, uh expose them as twists he almost adds these twists that are like oh it makes you think but the other things that are very subtle or the other things in the background are the most important actually and because he loves kubrick as i'm sure lots of people know nolan loving kubrick it could make a lot of sense why those things are actually highlighted more and more important in the narrative but people don't know so this one's really really good and i think it'd be really interesting to go through because he frequently wears it and doesn't wear it in the film and to people basically think that when he's wearing the ring he's in the dream and then when he's not wearing the ring he's in reality obviously because then he knows that um he's in the dream but i suppose the about the only thing that doesn't make any sense is i feel a spinning top is a lot more realistic and a lot more a lot it's a lot easier to know if you're in real life or not with that because of the physics behind it whereas the specific you know chinks in the wedding ring or the specific characteristics to it uh would be a bit more subtle and harder to distinguish yeah this is a really cool one love inception uh it's absolutely amazing and it would really give credence to and give 
a bigger meaning, better, bigger perspective to his other films, like in Tenet, you know, the, the theories that are in, that are to do with that film, the theories about that film, with, you know, for example, Robert Pattinson's, my fucking boy, fucking legend, his character being Cat's son, things like that, you know, this, these subtleties that are actually really important. It, it would make sense, you know, and it would actually give those other theories a bit more palpability, a bit more validity. And it's, it's always good to have that, always good. The briefcase is Marcellus Wallace's soul. So we all know the infamous briefcase in Pulp Fiction. The main thing that every character wants, at least in terms of the criminals and the underworld, is the briefcase, right? We all know that it's a valuable thing that characters are willing to die for right it's a very it's a very valuable almost you could even say priceless uh piece so could it be a soul i mean that is priceless it's worth with living or dying for it's worth a lot of money and obviously we don't know what's in it it's not like it's shown to be a feasible thing or it's shown to be a specific thing Right. And I think, you know, a soul could be kept in a briefcase. The only thing is when they open the briefcase, why doesn't it just fly away? You know, how, what is the, what are the physics behind it? But the gold, the gold nature of it, the gold light that's, that's coming from it also really uh, convinces us, I think, uh, theorists or just viewers in general, that it could be a soul. Also, the, the telltale sign is Marcel Wallace has a, a sort of band-aid, a, a little bandage patch on the back of his neck, which I think in the Bible or in iconography to do with souls is where the soul is it, it physio physiologically and then it's pulled out of there, taken out of there, that part of the body. So it would make sense that it's there because why else would it be there? Why else? Like who nicks themselves there? Who gets hurt there? It's a very specific spot to get hurt. You know, on your arm or your leg or something makes sense, but the back of your neck, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I actually think this is one of the most feasible ones on, on the list because that hasn't been like completely proved. Again, yeah, it doesn't make any sense why he would get hurt there. It's not like he's gonna be fucking shaving back there. You know what I mean? And then nicks himself there. And also it's quite a smooth part of the body. So that wouldn't even really make too much sense. It's not like the neck here where it's like a lot of ridges and stuff. It's quite a flat part of the body. So it just doesn't make sense, you know? And that really makes me at least believe, okay, you know, there's something going on here. Yeah, really fascinating one, man. I, I gotta say, the deeper it goes, the more interesting it guess i think i know that's kind of the point but i just i'm, I'm really enjoying these theories it's fucking good the aliens in signs are demons so i've not seen signs um but m night Shyamalan is a big twist boy a big twisty twisty he's like a big twister you know and he loves his little twisty wissies and for that reason it would make sense why the aliens that are in signs are actually demons i don't think they actually say uh, bluntly if they're aliens and the the creature's aversion to holy water apparently in the film um is apparent and would it would make sense why it's a demon because obviously demons don't like holy water um probably don't like any fucking water they probably just like fucking mead <laughs> i don't know they probably like blood that's really what they what they drink or they took a book out of twilight took a page out of... fucking i can't speak took a page out of Also, their malevolence and their evil, their pure evil, their wrath, you know, it would make a lot of sense. So I don't see why they can't be demons. And I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of parallels, at least in science fiction, even though aliens, I'm sure, are probably, you know, just as scared and just as malevolent as us. Yeah, really interesting. And I think it also lends a bit of a, a commentary on how aliens are shown in films, because again, I'm sure they're just as fucking malevolent as us yeah because we're because we're just fucking great aren't we and i just think uh, it's fucking awful what they think uh people people paint aliens to be that way because a being not being of this planet doesn't make it evil instantly and actually i think it's the other way around if you're fucking a human at least human not animals animals are better than humans uh, in every fucking way. Humans represent consciousness and making wrong decisions while being conscious of them i think that 
shows the fucking evil as opposed to other aliens that may not even be conscious you know they might have a completely different dimension of consciousness a completely different perception or evolution of consciousness so i think this uh could really lend a commentary to that and really give layer a layer to that uh how they're depicted in films yeah we are the awareness man we gotta be more conscious of our thoughts our actions you know so this is the end of tier three part one the videos and the tiers are getting shorter just because i've noticed that like a lot of the uh topics take up a lot of time because i'm just going on and talking about them a lot let me know if you prefer that but i just sort of find myself doing that more and also it's just easier for chat gpt to descript when it's shorter because i'm not having to process a lot of information and then that's you know it takes like four times uh, the fucking actual writing if you, if that makes sense and lots of repetition and more ed which means more editing which means they come out not as much as i'd want them to but anyway it's been really good for part one and uh i'm excited to see what you guys think about this tier this part take care of yourselves take care of each other thank you again for the all the support i really appreciate it and uh yeah i hope you guys enjoyed uh this part this tier so far uh, I can't. I just can't wait to get to the very bottom. You know, that's when all the sh shit hits the fan. Shit goes down. I've seen down there, and I'll tell you right now, you're gonna need some fucking. You need some flashlights in that biatch. You know what I mean? You're gonna need some flashlights down there because it's fucking dark, and it's well, it's not actually that dark. It's just obscure and like sort of mind blowing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thank you guys so much. Uh, I'll see you out there, neon hunting, and I'm out. I'm out of here.